Those who don't stand for something will fall for anything. That's what our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, has to teach us as our study of 2 Thessalonians continues here on Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host on this five-year journey through the whole Word of God, and I'm so happy to be traveling with you. You know, one of my favorite parts of this adventure is getting your letters and then hearing about your favorite stops along the way. The discoveries that you've made as well as the insights that you've gleaned from our study are so encouraging to us. Let's read one of those letters now. This one's from a young man named Rex in Cypress, California. With the completion of Proverbs, I just finished my first trip on the Bible bus. Way to go, Rex. Actually, I found the program back in April 2016, just in time to begin writing at our first stop in Genesis, and soon became so enthralled by all that I was learning that I began writing forwards and backwards every day, forwards with the daily broadcasts on the app and on local radio stations, and backwards with the TTB app. What a great way to redeem the time of my long commutes. Thank you for all the ways your team serves our listening family in America and around the world. I truly do feel a part of the Bible Bus family and love knowing that the bus fare my wife and I gladly pay every month is being stewarded wisely and boldly, both at home and abroad, to get the whole word to the whole world. I love hearing updates from brothers and sisters far off and how the Holy Spirit works in their lives. I also appreciate the insights from Brother Greg in his travels and Brother Steve's faithfulness in holding the Bible Bus doors open for us. A goal of mine is to be more faithful in praying for the ministry with the World Prayer Team. I know you often ask us to share what we've learned on this journey, and for me in this formative season of Bible bus travel, I'm 28, I feel overwhelmed in summing it all up. To try and put it succinctly, Dr. McGee's teaching through all the books of the Bible has given me a comprehensive picture of God's amazing plan of redemption through the ages. These amazing truths are just starting to crystallize in my mind, especially as I read my Bible. I've learned so much beyond hermeneutics, though, as I have had countless convicting and enlightening rubber-meets-the-road truths on my journey that I pray is making me a better Christian. Well, thanks, Rex. Thanks for your support of the Bible bus and then for sharing what you're learning. That's so encouraging to all of us. And God bless you as you continue to look to him and build your life on the foundation of his word. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for everyone who's gathered with us to study the Bible. We ask that you would draw us close to you. Lord, through the power of your spirit and your word, transform our minds as we submit to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're off with Dr. J. Vernon McGee to 2 Thessalonians 2 on Through the Bible. Now, friends, we pick up today at verse 10, but I'd like to back up to verse 7. He says, For the mystery of lawlessness doth already work. It was working in that day. Only he who now hindereth will hinder until he be taken out of the way. Now, the mystery of lawlessness began to work or was working in Paul's day. It continues to work. You remember the Lord Jesus gave the parable that the kingdom of heaven condition today, and he's not speaking of the church. Actually, he's speaking of the turn the kingdom of heaven took. It's a field today where the word of God is being sown, and that is a kingdom of heaven condition. But an enemy has come in and sown tares, and the tares and wheat are growing together. The Word of God and lawlessness grow together, and the world's getting worse and the world's getting better, actually. I think the Word of God's going out more today than it ever has in the history of the world. I think radio has been one of the mean. Television, maybe not as much, but radio today is really reaching out to the ends of the earth. My friend, we could take giant steps today if we just had the support of God's people who really want to see the Word of God given out. Doors are open, so the Word is growing. The wheat's growing today, but also the tares are. Lawlessness will continue to get worse and worse, but the Holy Spirit won't let him go all the way in this age. After the Holy Spirit's removed, it's like taking the stopper out of a bottle. I tell you, then the liquid will pour all over lawlessness, will pour all over the world in that day. And we're told, and then shall that wicked one or lawless one be revealed. 
That's Antichrist, or, yes, about 30 different aliases in the Word of God. The wicked one will be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. That is, that goes out of his mouth, a sharp two-edged sword. What is it? It's his Word. You see, the Word of God created this universe. All God had to do was speak. God said, let there be light. You know what light is? It's the Word of God. And today we have the written Word of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is the living Word of God. Not that the written Word's not living. And that's the reason it's so potent. And then when He comes, He's coming as the Word of God. He'll consume them with the spirit of His mouth. He shall destroy with the brightness of His coming. The epiphane, the shining forth of His coming. Now, when He came to Bethlehem, That was an epiphany. Paul says, The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. That was the gracious appearing of his coming. They talk today about some of us believe in a second and third coming of Christ. We believe in more than that, friends. He came 1,900 years ago. Epiphany, the epiphany. He came through. As George McDonough put it, he came a little baby thing that made a woman cry. Came and tabernacled in human flesh. Then he's going to come and take his church out of the world. And then he's going to come to the earth and establish his kingdom. And so that's three comings, if you want to look at it like that. And actually, his first coming was mixed up in two comings. He was born in Bethlehem, then you don't hear from him again until he's 30 years of age, and he breaks out and begins his ministry. You have a first coming there and a second coming, a little baby, and then a man 30 years old who walked into the temple and cleansed it. So all this nonsense today about, oh, you believe in a third coming of Christ, I can work in about four of them if you want me to. Nothing wrong with it. It's scriptural, by the way. Now he says here in verse 9, even his whose coming is after the working of Satan. This is Antichrist, Satan's man, the man of sin, the lawless one. And he will come after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now, power here is dunamis. That's physical power whose source is supernatural. That means that he's going to be quite a healer, I think. He'll do a lot of things. He'll perform miracles. He'll be a miracle worker, you see. I think he'll be able to walk on water. I think he might be able to control the wind. Satan at one time let a wind, you know, destroy the sons and daughters of Job. And then with signs. Now, the word signs means they're tokens. In other words, the purpose of which is to appeal to the understanding. This is going to appeal to the scientific world of that day. It'll appeal to politicians. It'll appeal to the religious world. And the phoniest kinds of things today, people are just taken in by it. I'm amazed how people will fall for that which is phony. And somebody said to me, why do you think that's true? Well, it can be expressed like this. Those who do not stand for something will fall for anything. And there are people today that are not rooted and grounded in the Word of God. And he's going to talk about that, by the way. Then lying wonders. That produces an effect upon observance. These lying wonders, people all over the world, my, they're going to talk about it. They say, my, this fellow, the world ruler day, he's a great fellow. Look what he can do. Now, who is it falls for him? Those who would not believe the gospel. And he'll do it with all deceivableness, verse 10 now, of unrighteousness in them that perish. Why? Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now, I do believe that the gospel is going to go out to the ends of the earth, even maybe by the church. And I'm not sure but what it's penetrating pretty well today, as I said, by radio. Radio is going lots farther today to get the word of God out. I believe that's our business. The Lord Jesus, then, is going to let the world believe a lie. And we're told here, verse 11, for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. 
And why does he do that? Isn't that a little unfair? Oh, no, no. It's just like it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. If you think that means that poor old Pharaoh wanted to let the children of Israel go and he was weeping and God really wouldn't let him, you're wrong. He didn't want to let them go. And what God did, he made him stand to it and he made him take a decision. You see, a lot of people are pussyfooting today. They won't take a stand for God. They won't listen to the gospel. They're closed to it. Now, God is going to give them and he's giving them the word of God. And after they hear the word of God and they won't accept it, then God will send them strong delusion. Why? Because they wouldn't receive the truth, then they'll believe a lie. And the people that are wide open today to the cults and the isms are people who've heard the gospel or church members. That's the reason some of them go around on Sunday morning and knock on your door because they know the weak saints will not be in a house of worship. They know that they are the weak ones. They don't want to study the Word of God. And as a result, they know they can get them. If you won't receive the truth, you're wide open for anything that comes along. And I've been amazed at some intelligent people that will sit in a church, hear the gospel, reject it, and then turn up the next thing you know, following the wildest cult or some individual that's as phony as all get out and not giving out the word of God at all. Why? Because this is the way that it is. God does that to separate sheep from goats. That's the best way in the world to do it. They wouldn't receive the love of the truth. And now he sends them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Now, what is the lie? Well, I think Antichrist is going to say to them, you people were really smart not becoming a bunch of religious nuts and believing a Jesus who was going to come and take you out of this world. These people that they took off probably on a trip to the moon and they've disappeared and they're out there in space somewhere and they don't know where they're going. I think he'll come up with quite a few explanations of it, and you people were smart to wait because we're going to build a kingdom right here on this earth, and the people are going to believe it, and they think they're entering the millennium, but they're entering the great tribulation. I think that's the lie. And why? In order that he can judge them, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And I've said this many times to my congregation, and I'd like to say it to this radio audience. If you can sit and listen to this program and continue to reject Jesus Christ, may I say this to you, that you are wide open for anything that comes along and you would never be able to go into the presence of God and say, well, I never heard the gospel before because, my brother, you are hearing it and you have heard it. And you probably heard it in several different places. And you turn your back upon it. And when you turn your back upon it, you're wide open. And you are a subject of judgment then for sure. Because we are savor of life to those that are saved. We are savor of death unto those that perish. Oh, I'm not your friend if you reject Jesus Christ. Because you couldn't go into God's presence and say you hadn't heard it. And... That's the thing I've always wanted to tell the man that rejects Christ. Brother, you are really, I've really put you out on a limb. You could never say you never heard it before. Now, Paul here, beginning with verse 13, he begins the practical side of this epistle, the practicality of the coming of Christ. What does it really mean for us today? Well, in light of the knowledge of future events, the believer should live a life that demonstrates that he believes in the coming of Christ. Believing in the coming of Christ doesn't mean to run out and look up in the sky and say, oh, I wish Jesus would come. That's just pious nonsense. May I say to you, it's going to manifest itself in several different ways. In view of that, believers should be established in the Word of God. And then believers should be established in their walk down here. And then believers should be established in their work. 
in all three of these. Now will you notice as we move down here at verse 13. Verse 13 now of 2 Thessalonians 2. But we are bound to give thanks all way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. And I'm going to read verse 14 also. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus. Now, I believe that these two verses here give you the total spectrum of salvation. In other words, they give you salvation from Dan to Beersheba, all the way from the past through the present to the future. You have it all given to you here. Now you have, first of all, you are chosen to salvation. I'd like, by the way, to give you a verse that goes along with this. It's over in the 8th chapter of Romans, and there it's put in a very doctrinal sort of way. It begins by him saying in verse 28 in Romans 8 now, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Dr. R.A. Tari used to say that this verse was a soft pillar for a tired heart, and it surely is. Now, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, we begin here with the first statement back in 2 Thessalonians now, verse 13. He says here that you were chosen from the beginning. You were chosen to salvation. Now, that looks back to the past. And all I know is what it says, and I believe it. You mean to tell me that God chose you before you even got here? Well, Spurgeon used to put it like this. He said, I'm glad God chose me before I got here because if he'd have waited till I got here, he never would have chosen me. Well, that makes sense. It simply means, friends, that you do not surprise God when you trust Christ. But we also need to let you see the other side of the corn. Whosoever will may come. And as another one has put it, the chosen are the whosoever will. And the non-elect are the whosoever wants. That's the way that it is. Whosoever will may come. If any man thirsts, that's a legitimate, that's a sincere, that is a definite offer without any complication to salvation. If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. And the reason you're not coming is not because you're not elected. The reason is you're not thirsty. You don't think you need a Savior. So chosen to salvation, that's here. That looks back to the past. Now, sanctification of the Spirit. And we said that when sanctification is used in connection with the Holy Spirit, it's practical. When it's connected with Christ, it is positional. So sanctification of the Spirit here means that he wants you to grow in grace down here. He wants you to grow. And then belief of the truth. That means that you are going to study the Word of God, belief of the truth. That's the way that you're going to grow. That's the way you're going to develop. And then he goes on here to speak to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this refers to the rapture, because, beloved, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. My, that's a glorious, wonderful statement, is it not? And then we have a statement in Colossians 1, 27, 
that says to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that looks to the future so that you have the total spectrum of salvation here. I have been saved. I am being saved. I shall be saved. Now, what is it that enables a believer to grow? It's the Word of God. Verse 15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. And Paul's referring to what, of course, he had taught them over there when he was there. The Word, you see, enables a believer to stand and be stable. The Word brings consolation and comfort. The Word and work are interrelated. The study of the Word will lead to the work of the Lord. Listen to Paul now here, verse 16. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God even our Father which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Now, he's to comfort your hearts. The word of God will comfort you and it will edify you. That is the important thing. And if you're edified, it'll bring comfort to you. And establish you means you'll get rooted and grounded in the Word of God. You won't be carried away by every wind of doctrine. You won't be going out after every fad today and reading every new book that comes from the press today that plays up something of the moment that people are interested in. And you won't have to be running all the time to these little study courses where you take sort of a course. It's sort of like taking an aspirin tablet or maybe taking Geritol or something like that to sort of build you up, you see, for the moment. We need to be established in the faith. Now, friends, this is very important. You see, the Word of God is therefore that which will lead you to do the work of God. Now we're going to see next time in chapter 3 that believers can be established in their walk. And the walk is your life before the world. And the believer needs to be established in his work down here. You see, today it's rather deceitful and you deceive yourself and others when you talk about how much you love the coming of the Lord and you don't study his word and it doesn't manifest itself in your life and it doesn't make you work. You see, if you really believe Christ is coming, you're really going to be busy. You're going to work for him because you're going to give an account to him. And if he's going to be here tomorrow, I want to be busy today. And you won't have your nose pressed against the window looking for him to come are always looking up into heaven. You're going to be looking around you, doing the work of the Lord down here. That's the greatest proof that you believe in His coming. Now we're going to see the walk and the work next time in chapter 3. Probably we'll get through chapter 3, and then we're going to begin in Jeremiah. So until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. If you want to be grounded in the Word of God and be a part of God's work here on earth, we can help. First and most important, our hope is that you grow in faith and knowledge and wisdom of God's Word. So please continue to join us for this daily teaching right here on your station or by listening by app or online at ttb.org. And to help you follow along with our studies and to go deeper into God's Word on your own, sign up for our monthly newsletter online at ttb.org or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE and ask to be added to our mailing list. And ttb.org is also the place to download our free Bible companion for 2 Thessalonians. It's got everything you need to study God's Word. Check it out at ttb.org. I personally use it along with my small group to study the Bible together, one book at a time. Next, if you'd like to be a part of Through the Bible's work in getting God's whole Word out to the whole world, call us. 1-800-65-BIBLE is the number. We'd love to have you join our faithful group of prayer warriors called our World Prayer Team, too. And if God leads you, we'd love for you to partner with us financially. 
As Dr. McGee mentioned, many more people need to hear his word. And that number again is 1-800-65-BIBLE or visit us online at ttb.org. Meet me right back here next time as we continue to make our way through the Bible. Through the Bible is a five-year study of God's entire Word, and together we discover God's purposes in history and our lives, found only when we believe in Jesus Christ. Do you know Him yet?